This is Discord. This is what popular YouTuber Juxtapose designed, and this is the fully functional Discord clone I built from scratch with Flutter and ServerPod using Jux's Figma files. This project has about 6,000 lines of code written in a span of 4 months, and it's absolutely feature-packed. In this video, I'm breaking down exactly how I turned this design concept into a fully functional app. I will also take you in-depth into how I built the core features and we will discuss the routing, the state management, the architecture, file structure and the server side stuff that makes it all work. And I'm also giving away the source code and explainer resources for free without trying to convince you to buy my course. Imagine being normal in 2025. If you've ever wanted to build full stack feature rich apps in Flutter, then you're in the right place. Discord is a chat application where users can hang out in a group or in DMs. Join audio and video calls and it also allows users to live stream content. What I built is a subset of the original Discord. One dev can only do so much I guess. Let's take a look at what features I built for the Discord clone. When the user opens our app, they go to the sign up or sign in screen where they can either log in using their credentials or create a new account. Once logged in, the user is taken to a beautiful loading screen where app data is loaded and then we are taken to the home page. Starting from the top left side, we have more servers, the list of servers we are a member of, at server and the user's profile. For accessibility, each button has a tooltip and the server buttons animate from a circle to a square when they are hovered or selected. We will see that the channels and the chat reloads whenever any server is selected. Just like Jux's design, this sidebar animates to a broader bar when we click on the profile icon. We can see that each icon has expanded to display the tooltip content as separate text and has a nice hover color to it as well. The profile section expands to provide us the options to globally configure our mic settings and then we have the option to collapse the menu back to a smaller sidebar. Just like the server bar, we also have the channel bar which contains the server background, the server name, the collapsible groups, and the channel buttons with consistent hover colors. We can also create new channels using the plus button. If we want more focus, we can hide the channel bar completely by pressing the drawer button at the top, and pressing it again will expand it back to its full size. Clicking on the channel button will take you to that channel's chat, and if we click on any voice channel, it will join that room and start Start a call. If we join a voice channel when the server bar is expanded, you will see a smooth animation which transforms the profile section, providing us with extra options to control the call settings. To the right is the chat section so we can chat in different channels. Whenever we write a message and press enter, it will dim the message until the server has confirmed the delivery status, in which case it turns back to its normal color. If we scroll to the top of the chat, we are going to see that it loads more messages since this chat is paginated. And we will also get a pop-up enabling us to go back to recent chats if we scroll too far from them. All the messages are grouped according to their dates and hovering over a chat will pop the delete button and we can press that to delete the message from the chat. On the top right, we can fetch the members of this server and we can also search the chats inside the selected channel. The result of the search will highlight the matched text. We can also press the drawer icon to open or close this menu. Similar to the chat section, if we click on any voice channel, we can join a voice call. If we hover over the section, we're going to see more controls animating in, like toggle mic, toggle camera, and toggle screen share buttons. If we leave the call and there are no participants, we're going to see a call to action to initiate the voice call again. While I am in call from macOS, let me log in from another user using the web and start a group voice call. We can see both the users in the voice call on each window. We can also screen share with others by pressing the screen share button and sharing the selected window. Or, we can stop screen sharing at any point and switch to a video call.
we can look at all our servers by clicking this button. In the search bar, we can search servers and we can click on any server to navigate to that server. Let's dive into the technical details and see how everything has been implemented. If you look at the app, it has a unique title bar on macOS, but Flutter apps have this. So how do we go from this title bar to that? First, in your project, open your macOS folder in Xcode. Then in Xcode, select Runner, Runner again, then Resources, and then the main menu. In main menu, click on App Name, and then a menu will open to the right. Now check Hide Title Text, Transparent Title Bar, and Full Size Content View. With this, we have successfully implemented the title bar. Despite some people in the community suggesting Go Router for this project, I found that Auto Route worked well for me and so I just went with it. The routing is astonishingly simple for this project. Here's how it works. The initial page is the loading Wumpus page that we saw earlier and it has logic which is responsible for further routing inside the app based on the auth status. At the same level, we have the login and home routes. The home route has nested routes like the servers page and the actual server routes. The server's route then has a channel route to navigate to different channels. We're going to see in the state management section how both come together to achieve app functionality. Let's see how this router structure helps us in rendering out the Discord layout. I am using Row plus Expanded along with Auto Router. The Auto Router widget is then responsible for laying out the correct widget based on the router. This means that whenever the home route is hit, we render the sidebar and the expanded Auto Router widget. Similarly, when the channels route is hit, we then render the channel bar and the expanded Auto Router widget. This gives us more control and we can render a different view by replacing the server URL. For example, we can go to the More Server screen by by hitting the server slash all URL. And technically, we should be able to go to the search or DM sections in the future by creating those routes as servers routes as well. And now we come to the second most controversial topic when building any app in Flutter. I used qubits which are part of the Flutter block library. But why not blocks? Well, why not qubits? You don't have to declare events and since there are no events, there is no event handler. One problem gone and one to go. I wanted to use qubits but I really didn't like this pattern in my UI files. Also, whenever I emit a new state, my old state and its properties are lost. So what do we do if we don't want this? Enter freeze. With freezed, each state object is immediately mutable and we can easily change the properties of the state object using the copy with method. In the UI layer, we no longer have block builders rebuilding because the state object was changed to an entire different class. And this is how we can access the state variables. And this is exactly what I did. Now let's take a look at how all of the qubits work together to achieve a consistent app state. The auth qubit is responsible for, you guessed it, checking if the user is logged in or not. This is done through the session manager API provided by ServerPod. We call the checkout function inside the loading screen. And if the user is logged in, we then fetch the servers for that user and fetch the user details. Once we get the servers, we then fetch the channel groups for that server and the chats for the first channel in that server. We then start the message listener, which is basically a WebSocket to that channel's chat. While the data is being fetched, we navigate to the channel providing the server and the channel IDs to the router. When the user clicks on a new server, we fetch the channel groups and the first channel's chat again and navigate the same way to that server's channel. When the user clicks on any channel, we refresh the message listener to listen to that channel's chat and fetch the chats. As usual, we provide the router with the updated channel ID so that we can navigate. When the user clicks on the live stream, we open a live room using that channel's ID and then the user connects to that room. The live stream qubit holds the connected room state and keeps it until the user clicks away to another channel or disconnects from the call. The live stream controls and the live stream section that shows up above the profile section are handled through the live stream qubit. And with this, we move on to the most controversial topic in the Flutter world. For architecture, I used a mixture of clean architecture and MVVM.
Well, in my defense, this is what AI had to say about my decisions. The combination of clean architecture with MVVM patterns gives you clear separation of concerns, testable business logic, maintainable code base, scalable architecture, and predictable state management. There is a clear flow of data. The UI layer sends the events to the application layer, which is responsible for the business logic. The application layer then sends the requests to the infrastructure layer where all the repositories reside, and then data can be fetched back to the UI layer in the same way. The UI layer doesn't talk to the infrastructure layer, the infrastructure layer doesn't know about the application layer and the immediate benefit for this is that the APIs that reside in each layer can be changed as needed. So qubits can be changed to blocks or providers and repositories can depend on an HTTP client rather than the client from server pod. I went big on DI and that is why in the locator we can see that for each qubit service and repository we have the DI from get it that handles it all. Thanks to server pod, we do not need the domain layer as we are using all the models from the server pod client. The file structure is really simple. The presentation folder has all the screens, their widgets, and the common components. The application folder has all the qubits, and the infrastructure folder has all the repositories. These folders then have files organized according to different features. So for the chat feature, I have the chat screen, chat qubit, chat state, and then chat repository. The authentication feature is already baked into server pod. Here's how simple it is. We go to pubspec.yaml in the server directory and add the server pod auth server package to it. Then we set up the authentication code inside the server file. We need to use auth config class which provides us the send validation email which is fired whenever a user signs up and we receive the validation code. Ideally, the SMTP server configurations should be called from here to send the email to the user. It also provides us the onUser created method which is fired when the user completes the signup flow. This also creates an entry into the server pod user info table and this user is then available through the handle for further processing, like creating a wrapper user table entry around it with more details. To make this in a relation in a separate table, we can add it to the user info field like this. In the Flutter project, we need the server pod auth email Flutter, server pod auth shared Flutter, and server pod Flutter packages. And then we can implement the entire authentication UI by adding the sign in with email button provided by server pod and passing the auth module and other optional parameters. Now let's talk about the real time chat feature. Each message represents a message that you see in the chat section and represents an entry in the message table. The message table has sender information, message content, content type, which is default text right now but can support image or video, the timestamp, the channel ID for which this message was sent, is delivered for confirming message delivery, and is deleted for marking the message for soft deletion. When we want to send a message, we first get the sender info using the sender ID. We then use this information to create an entry in the message table with the isDelivered flag implicitly set to false. We then update the created message and set the delivery flag to true, which we will update once the broadcast is successful. We can broadcast messages using the post message method available through the session.messages API, where we pass the channel ID to which we need to send the message and the updated data. We then listen to these messages by subscribing to a stream provided by server pod where we create the message stream using the session.messages API for the given channel and using an await for loop. For live stream, we don't store anything in the database, we just create a token on the server side. For generating token, we use the livekit server SDK package. We then get the user details and generate the access token using the livekit API key, API secret, user ID and establish the identity by passing the username and the user profile image. This is done so we can access these attributes in the live stream view where we can display each participant's metadata. We then add grants to the access token and return it in JWT format. And finally, we move on to the last topic of the video. I also made the app work for mobile, 
except screen share is disabled for the mobile at the moment. These are the two things I changed. I added extra padding and removed controls using the is mobile flag which basically checks the screen width. And then I also changed the entire router so that the chat, the live stream and the more server sections are pushed as separate routes on top of the home routes. In these cases I made sure that the chat and server routes were pushed as long as it was a mobile device and that's it. Congratulations, you're now a full stack app developer. Before we wrap up, I want to share something exciting with you. The complete source code and explainer pictures will be released in my YouTube community feed in about one to two weeks. So if you want to get the notification for that post, you need to like this video and subscribe to the channel right now. What should we build next? Drop your wildest product ideas in the comments. If your idea sparks something, I'll build it. I'm also launching a Discord community where we can brainstorm these ideas together and share concepts. If you have a design ready and want to collaborate on bringing it to life, that's where we can make it happen. Thanks for watching. I hope you really learned something today and I will see you in the next one.